right, welcome everyone to our October 10th, uh, 2024 Long-Term Financial Policy and Audit Subcommittee. Uh, seeing a quorum, Madam Host, can you please take the roll? Absolutely. Chair Rogers? Present. Member Stapp? Present. Member McDonald? Here. Let the order reflect that all subcommittee members are present. Thank you. Uh, I think we did this, but as a reminder, to all present, please set your cell phones um, to do not disturb, silent. The city of Santa Rosa is committed to providing safe and inclusive environment free from uh, disruption and will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully, or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. And we will now have a public comment on non-agenda matters. Um, which is item two. This is a time when any person may address the subcommittee on matters not listed on this agenda, but which are within the subject matter of the jurisdiction. And it does not look like we have anyone that is present um, for public comment. So we will now move on to the approval of minutes. Um, we have one set of hmm, we have one set of minutes for June 13, 2024, which was a regular meeting. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, the minutes will be adopted as presented. Let the record also reflect that the cancellation notices for the July 11. In August 8, 2024, and September 12, 2024, meetings have also been included in the minutes. We'll now proceed. Oh, let the record also uh, show that there is no one in um, no public present to give public comment. We'll now proceed to item 4.1. Fiscal year 23 24, year in budget review and budget reduction planning um, and I'll hand it over to Chief Financial Officer Alton. Actually, we're gonna have Veronica kick this one off. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. So today we're gonna be discussing our general fund review for 23-24 as well as a budget reduction strategy. Um, I'll start the first part of the presentation with our fourth quarter results for the general fund, which should be pretty quick. No new surprises since we've last met to discuss the third quarter. And from there, I will hand it off to our deputy director, Scott Wagner, who will go over some of our reserves discussion. And from there, it will go back to our CFO, Alan Alton, who will talk about our budget reduction strategies coming up. If we could please advance the slide to next one. So to get started on our year-end results for fiscal year 23-24, we're starting with just an overall view of where we ended the year in the general fund. So this year we did end in a deficit. This is operational numbers. So what this means is we've backed out anything like grant activity or investment gains and losses um, in volatile things that don't have anything to do with our operations. And at the end of June, so starting in July, we adopt a budget that is operational. We want our revenues to support our expenditures as much as we can. And this is a reflection of how that annual budget performed. So in conclusion, you'll see that we brought in less revenues and transferred in less resources than we spent. So we ended the year at about a $3.1 million operational deficit. Next slide, please. Uh, we adopted a deficit of 3.3 million and we came in at 3.1, so we were very close. Two things affected this. One was we brought in a little bit less revenue than we budgeted, but we also spent less expenditures than we budgeted. So spending less expenditures means there was turn back, but since we did adopt a deficit budget, it was not enough to close that budget gap. We closed it by just about 200,000 and still came out with a $3.1 million deficit. And next slide. So looking at our operational revenues in the general fund, and these are major revenue categories that we touch on quarterly. 
No new surprises here. Our property taxes came in a bit over, which was good because our next line item sales taxes, which is our greatest revenue generator in the general fund, came in very low. We were um, $5.8 million short of our budget, and that was a very serious impact to our general fund this year. We had heard throughout the year that sales tax was slowing. We did not necessarily expect it to come in quite this low, but thankfully we made up for it in other categories. Our utility users tax has continued to be going high. This is based basic mostly on um, UUT on PG&E and energy costs. As our energy bills go up, the taxes that we pay on those go up as well. Our other taxes category came in a bit over budget as well, and we'll talk about that more on the next slide. Licenses and permits and charges for services came in just under budget. This was driven mostly by some of our PED revenues starting to drop off. Recreational revenues are in charges for services. Those have remained strong post COVID, but what we're seeing in the building and planning divisions are smaller dollar projects happening and less of the large development projects. Um, I also talked to some of our head employees yesterday and they were explaining to me that we've been relying a lot on third party building plan review. And when we do that, it eats up a good portion of our revenue. This isn't the case of us bringing in revenue and paying a consultant to do the work. They actually take the revenue, collect it, do the work and give us less revenue than we would end up with if we had brought it in through our front door. So relying on third party building plan review occurs when we aren't fully staffed or when we have help positions or when we are having trouble recruiting for positions. So that's impacting some of our revenues. Um, but again, in the planning and engineering sectors, that's mostly due to smaller projects of a smaller dollar value occurring just due to development trends. Um, the next slide, please. So this is the detail of other taxes on the previous slide. This is a category that did come in over budget this year. A few competing factors on this one, some coming in high, some coming in low. Um, the business tax line item has done well. As we've been coming out of COVID, we've seen this one grow. And while we're increasing our budget every year, we didn't increase it quite enough to meet what came in. So that was good to see a few hundred thousand extra over budget. Real property transfer tax continues to be low. This is the kind of opposite effect where we have been trying to reduce our budget annually, but not be too reactive, but we still have not reduced it quite to where we're seeing the actuals come in. And again, real property transfer tax is just a result of the real estate market not having a lot of volume of turnover these days due to high interest rates. Occupancy tax has rebounded. Um, about $850,000 of that 6.8 million is due to short-term rentals, vacation rentals. The remainder is your hotels and motels in Santa Rosa. So those are rebounding post-COVID and growing at a good rate. Uh, worth mentioning, too, is our cannabis industry tax. I believe in the current fiscal year, 24-25, we did bump that budget up just to about $1.9 million. This is one that we see fluctuate, go up and down. So even though we did exceed budget this year, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a growth trend happening. It's just one of the years that it was a little higher. We're seeing it stabilize right around $1.9 million. And next slide, please. So this slide just compares last year's revenues to where we came in this year. Um, the big ones to point out are that second line down sales taxes. We see that drop. We had been told early on in fiscal year 23, 24, that sales tax would probably be slowing. Our consultants and a lot of industry experts were saying that post COVID, a lot of the spending was slowing down. We didn't necessarily expect it to go negative. So this was a big eye opener to see it actually go down year over year. Um, the other one to mention down on miscellaneous, the second line from the bottom, we see a big variance there. Back in 22, 23, we actually received a few million dollars of our PG&E settlement funds from the wildfire, it came in a few years late. So that was just a one-time thing last year that had our revenue look a little bit high compared to this year. So overall, you can see that our revenue went down as compared to last year, we brought in about $2 million less. And this was mostly driven by sales tax as we see that, like I say, that's our uh, largest revenue generator in the general fund. So when that one drops, it's hard to bake it up elsewhere. Next slide, please. Oh, oh sorry, go ahead. If I may just add one thing about sales tax really quick. So the, 
we had a um, would have been a fourth quarter um, consensus uh, review of that. This is California wide sales tax, uh, but this is from one of there's there's two leading consultants. There's one that we use, and then there's HDL. This just happened to be an HDL. Um, presentation, but what they're seeing, and I think Avenue backs this up, is that um, as Veronica said, we weren't expecting, they weren't expecting negative returns in sales tax, and they, they did see that in the last year. Um, they are looking for next to uh, uh, flat to zero growth uh, for the first coming months of uh, or the first two quarters of this fiscal year and and then a very uh, slow growth um, uh, beginning in January. So what you're looking at is the potential that we may not we had been hoping that that the revenues will eventually catch up with our estimate. We've been holding it flat looking for eventually those revenues would catch up. What we're seeing now it, as, as those experts keep revising their, uh, um, uh, their estimates downward, that we're in a spot where we may have to, in the upcoming fiscal year, actually lower our sales tax um, estimate because again, not just seeing it, uh, uh, grow slowly, we're actually seeing it decline year over year. If it declines two years, year over year, then we're, that's, that's pretty telling for us. So that's just a, a heads up of something that, that we're monitoring very closely. Thank you, Alan. And this graph is just a visual representation of just that. We see that top line is sales tax and you can see some pretty steep growth between 1920 and 2122. It covers almost $10 million, more than $10 million there. And then it starts to level out and drop. So we know eventually at one point, this line will start to recover and increase again. We just don't know when that will be. So for the next, as Alan said, the next year, especially we aren't expecting it to rebound. It will take a little bit of time. Um, the bottom line, the orange one, is also an interesting story to tell there. These are our charges for services. It started to decline in 2021. That was when all of our recreation programs were closed down over COVID. And while we saw them to rebound a bit in 21-22, they're now dropping off again as PED revenues have started to decline. So there's some competing factors within that line item. Property taxes is the second to the bottom line, which has always had pretty regular sustained growth. And then other taxes is that second line from the top that has, I mentioned also competing factors in there as we see our PTT decline, but we're seeing business tax and occupancy tax grow. So overall the positive growth factor remains strong in that one. And next slide, moving on from our revenue discussion, we're looking back now at the last year's worth of expenditures in the general fund. So our adopted budget plus changes of expenditures was 199 million and we spent about 196. We have some encumbrances at year end, which puts us at the end of the year, turning back about $1.2 million. So we did not spend all of our expenditures, but we came within 0.6%, which is as close as we want to get. And this is I always say it's, you know, by design, this is not accidental. Departments make every effort to spend every dollar they have without going over. But a few unique things happened this year. So for one in salaries and benefits, which we know are about 76, 77% of all expenditures, this is where we spend the most of our money. We did turn back a little over $3 million altogether. This is due to vacancies. We do have a vacancy credit, but still we had um, vacancies in excess of what we budgeted for. And then we overspent in our services and supplies. Some of this overspending was intentional. Departments can get permission from the city manager's office to spend um, consultant services if they have a vacancy that's difficult to recruit for 
or if they have some salary savings, they may put that towards something they need to buy at the end of the year if they know they didn't spend all of their sal um, salaries and benefits budget. But we also did have some unforeseen expenditures this year, um, our labor negotiations exceeded what we had budgeted for, and our maintenance costs for police and fire vehicles were quite a bit higher than what was budgeted for. Our um, fire fleet, the apparatus and engines are very old. We have many vehicles on order, but the wait time is two to three years, I believe. This is not unique to us. It's across the board and industry-wide, so our maintenance costs have been quite high in those areas, which have been driving that change. And next slide. So this is a comparison of the first two columns compare year to year of what we've spent by department. And you can just kind of visually see we do expect an increase year over year as salaries and benefits and professional services costs increase. And then the next two columns, we have our actual encumbrances compared to budget. So that second column from the right where it says over under budget this shows us where all of our departments came out at the end of the year. So negative is good, that means under budget. And at the bottom line, we can see we came in under budget at 1.2 million. This is that same figure we saw on the previous slide. It's just broken out by department now instead of salary benefits and services and supplies. Um, some of the big things to notice, I'll point out on the very bottom line that non-departmental figure, while it appears that we overspent by 3 million, that's actually our vacancy credit. It's a little bit of a confusing subject, but we put in a negative budget amount for a vacancy credit of 3 million. We have zero expenditures because it's not a true expenditure line item, which will then make it appear that we have overspent by 3 million. But that 3 million is offsetting vacancies in the other departments. So where you see public works having turned back of 1.1 million and planning and economic development having turned back of 1.1 million, a lot of that is due to vacancies. We're trying to budget for those vacancies. Overall, we did um, spend about $10 million more than the previous year, which is in line with what we see in terms of salaries and benefits and other services and supplies increasing. Can you um, <clears throat> give us like, when we see expenditures that are over, how does that work? Like who approves? Who approves that? How does the, if we have a budget mm -hmm. and we go, you guys know I always talk about personal in my checkbook, right? So if I have a budget and I'm going to go over, which means I'm going to use a credit card in my case. So, but I'm going to talk to my husband about that before I do that. Who approves the overages or do the departments just go over and they go over and it is what it is? Well, we look at things at the fund level. So as a whole, we look at the general fund at the bottom line. And if one department, so for one, we don't want anybody to go over and me and my team are watching departments very closely. Sometimes there's a reason that departments go over, for example, city attorney, they had um, staffing costs and they had contract services that were out of their control. So in those cases that would be approved by the city manager if they have to take on a significant new expense. For the most part, departments do not go over if we see a department has gone over and we know the whole general fund as a whole is over budget, we will have them pull from their projects and move appropriations in to offset their overspending. But we try not to do that if it's not necessary because we also don't want to short our projects, the funding that they need. Okay, um, something I was thinking is um, when you ask, when someone comes and they, and this is probably for you, when someone comes and they ask for um, money for something that we know where they're at with their expenditures already. So we can kind of keep track. I think sometimes departments will come and ask for something and we'll say yes, because there's a need, but we really don't know. Like we have no idea where they're at. They could be a million dollars over what we allocated. You may know, but we don't know when they come ask us. So that might be something that would help us out. So we can kind of know as we go, um, because if we're, if a department is over, then there must be a need and we need to address the need. Um, in some cases, not all, I know some is staffing, but there's a need. So how can we address the need instead of keep putting band-aids on them and then they go over and they're not within their budget? And I request those justifications uh, when we're meeting uh, 
usually it's in the agenda review when we have those discussions. I usually ask those discussions. If it's a contract, you know, the question I have to staff, is it time for us to go back out for a new RFP mm -hmm. instead of continuing to do another amendment? But sometimes the amendments are built into the contracts and we're just executing that amendment. But I do ask those questions. Okay. And just for us to get a, a high level overview, mm -hmm. it probably would be nice instead of coming at the end and then it's like, bam, this is what it is. And it's like, well, how can we support the departments prior to getting to the end? And it's like, they're, they're over, right? How do we do our job by supporting? Yes. So um, one thing that could be helpful is when we approve the contracts, if it says at the bottom, this is within this general fund budget mm -hmm. and really flag for us that it's not, this is over and above. That would help us during decision-making time. I know sometimes I, I can catch it on the reports, but if that could be more explicit, I think for um, council, so that that would be a red flag to me is if it says it right there, this is not a uh, approved expenditure. That would be one way for us to help track it. I think, um, and then I lost my train of thought on the other way that I've seen it done. But the bottom line is what we want to know is burn rate. If we do something at the beginning of the year, if we are halfway through the year and they've burned up 90% of their budget, even though we're meeting constantly on these figures, that doesn't help us know the burn rate. And I know that all of you are tracking it, but it helps us when the community is like, why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? And we're like, well, we've already gone through 87% of the budget and we're in July. So, you know, or whatever the month is. So we, that, that would be helpful if you're saying out of the budget, 77% of it goes to staffing. Mm -hmm for that budget. So if they have $10 million, 77% of that's going to staffing. So you don't have that much to do the other projects that you wanna do with. That kind of information where we talk about granular information about the budget is what helps us become spokespeople for the way that the city budget is run because it's so confusing because of where things are being funded from. So those, those things would be suggestions that we can maybe add it's not too much work for staff to add those to the reports. I think that would help. So if, if I may, I, I want to make this point though very clear. No contract is brought to council that was not part of the adopted budget. If a contract is brought to council that was not part of the adopted budget, it is absolutely called out within the staff report. It is absolutely called out within the resolution on where those funds are coming from. Certainly, I think to your point, uh, Member McDonald, as far as burn rate, that message is very well received. I think I think having that understanding of where they're coming up in everywhere else to understand that that contract now is now putting them over, where in the beginning of the year it wasn't, it's very important. So just look for clarification on that, Scott, you're saying yeah. that no contract that comes to us hasn't been budgeted for in that year? If it wasn't, it's getting called out as in this is going to be a use of your reserves. As part of my review, when I review an agenda item, it is to go through and make sure that whatever contract they're bringing through was part of their budget adoption. So it was part of their budgetary plan. You know, using the fire department as an example, what's not part of the plan is that all of a sudden the parts on the fire engines cost three times the, what they cost during budget adoption. It's those burn exactly what you're talking about that changes the math. For now our budget adoption numbers are different than what we're seeing in actuals. And we're usually in those cases, you have two actions that are happening with that, that item. You're not only approving the contract, but you're increasing appropriations to be able to pay for it. So those are the that those are the red flags that you would want to look for to see if something was is is outside of their normal budget appropriation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I want a dollar amount. So, like, we know where they are is what I'm asking for. Understand. Yeah, so contracts are fine. I know we approve them, and I know we need to approve them sometimes, but I want to say, I want it to say, like, this is what was allocated, and this is where we are, um, and have those up to date when they come to council. So I guess the departments would need to have those up to date. Um, sorry for the... Disruption. No, that's fine. That's actually the end of my section. So I was going to say, if anyone has any questions <laughs> on these previous slides, I'm happy to answer them. Any of our revenues and expenditures before I hand it off to Scott. But 
Yeah, and I think we did want to hear what is it that you need from us to help you to just like a council member McDonald explained to help you understand the budget better. I, you may not have that answer right now, but we want to hear your feedback on ways we can communicate so you can explain it better so you can be our spokesperson. And we have had that discussion internally, but we really want to hear from you. Yes. So one of the things I love is pie charts. Where is the money coming from to fund this specific thing? So if you're looking at a CIP budget, sometimes it comes from federal, sometimes it comes from state, sometimes it comes from general fund. Where is the money coming from specifically to fund what programs? So that's a very large portion of our budget, but it's not clear to, I think, maybe all of council, you know, and I'll just use myself as, as an example. It's not totally clear to me what's funding what. And so when we go back out, people are like, well, just take the money from here and put it here. We don't have that option if it's a grant specific to. So I think as we break down the budget, that's one way to do it. It's to say this money comes in from the Department of Housing to help with homeless services or the state is giving us a grant so that yes, you look at a $4 million budget, but 3 million of it might be funded from the state or this might require matching money from the general fund. Those breakdowns for us, I think help explain the story of how complicated government finance is, but it also helps us tell the story of we can't toggle the money around as much as you think that we can. It, it is specific for this. And that to me is the way that not only we learn about how the budget works, but we can tell the, the public how the budget works. So the figure of the 77%, does that solely come out of general fund? Does that come out of departments? Does it come out of each of the departments? Those kinds of things, I think, where you break it down for us. And I know we've said it when we did budget presentations, IT have actually gave us a breakdown of their staff breakdown, how many people and what they did that helps us too, so that there's a picture that shows we have 15 people in this department that runs all of this, and this is where their money is funded from. It, it has to have a narration of the story of what it's funding, where it's coming from, and how we make the decisions as council to prioritize within that and how they tie to our goals. That'd just be a few of my ideas for now. <laughs> I might have been thinking about this one for a while. It's not good to hear. Yeah. All right. Oh, perfect timing. I'm up. So next slide, please. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the chair if any questions come on these ones. Please feel free. We're going to cover some reserves. Reserves are a really critical point of discussion around once an agency like ours is now experiencing real deficits. What I want to do in these next few slides is I want to have a little more robust discussion about what are reserves. Um, reserves often get, often get talked about as reserves, but to me, there's different types of reserves and we need to understand each one and how each one of those is going to be affected here going forward, given our deficit. Um, I want to talk about what reserves can do and what they can't do. I want to talk about what our strategy development is that Alan's going to go into in greater depth and how that impacts reserves and what, what our plan is and how it's going to work. Um, so in general, when Veronica and Alan come for these quarterly updates, they're talking about an operational surplus or deficit. And I will use, uh, as the mayor talks about her own checking account, it's a little more complicated than just money in, money out when it comes to our reserves. It's more complicated than that. So I want to talk about that in greater detail. But when Veronica and Alan come and they talk about their, you know, our operating surplus or deficit over a quarter, it really is that money in, money out. What is the amount of money that's been spent? What got brought in and what's that difference? And what we've seen in the last year, which Veronica broke down, is that our deficit has become real. We're actually seeing it reduced now. $3 million deficit that got passed with adoption, that's roughly the operating deficit that we got passed that ended up having, coming to fruition. But when we talk about reserves, we need to start talking about some additional factors that are going to impact us. One that's probably the most obvious, as we were kind of talking about it a moment ago, was if council actions come that appropriate from reserves. I can't remember a year where we haven't had that happen. That is consistent. Where our budget gets adopted and developed and all of a sudden a need arises or um, 
something along the ways where we need to have come back to council and say, hey, we need more additional funds to target this specific council need or area need or community need to be addressed. We put some examples on here just to kind of help remind us of some that have come. There's been $2 million for Bennett Valley Golf Course irrigation, an $800,000 radio upgrade pro uh, project, a graffiti abatement program, vacant lot program. These are all items that went to council Council approved. We're not part of the original budget, but when it comes time for us to do the reserves, those are going to impact our reserves. Okay. So your operating deficit, deficit, which was one number, now has another number because we're adding on to it. There's other things that aren't included either, and these get a little more complicated. Um, interest earnings on investments, loss on investments. Uh, we don't know that throughout the year. It, it, We've actually experienced some pretty large fluctuations over the past few years, like everyone has, given COVID and then the COVID recovery. That's not included. So we're going to look at, well, how did our investment portfolio do? That's going to be an either positive or negative impact. The last one here is really important, and it's the one that's probably the hardest to, to explain and the hardest to predict. I'm going to try my best. So it's the release of appropriations and encumbrances. And I'll give examples to help us understand this. So as part of the budget adoption, let's say we adopted a $2 million contract to, I don't know, we'll make something up, uh, buy new tables for, for, the, for the city. And we went through the contract of buying tables and we only ended up buying $1 million worth of tables in that contract, not the full two. But what happens is that the remainder of that contract gets released. Right? We had previously dedicated $2 million to this contract. We only used a million dollars of it. That other million is going to get released. So our reserves are going to go up by that million dollars, right? Because we thought we had dedicated that money to us to a certain task. We didn't spend it all. And now we're taking some back. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that happens throughout the year. And as you can imagine, we have more complicated contracts than buying tables. And we're going to have a fluctuation through the year there that we can't predict. But that's going to mean an up and down. That's also true of projects. So a project we thought building a park was gonna cost $4 million, but it only cost $3 million. We've got an extra million dollars left over. We as a budget team, we as a finance team go through, we do that analysis, we release those funds, and it changes our savings account at the end outside of just that money in, money out. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Great. Next slide, please. So structural deficits like the finance department and city manager's office have been speaking about cannot be addressed through reserves. The function of reserves is going to be to give us a time period to strategically look at our city operation, to find efficiencies, to make some structural changes to get us to the level where we are sustainable. Again, one-time funding cannot address an ongoing need of the city. That is just a, a timing need. Okay, but we have gone through the process of analyzing any one-time funding that can be released, that can be utilized to shore up our reserves to give us the flexibility to make that happen. And I'm going to talk about that some more towards Alan's part of the presentation as well. Um, ongoing expenditures really come from a simple place, meaning increased staffing and new programs and services to when we pay for any of those things with one-time funds, it is just making our structural deficit larger. Um, that is currently an issue we have had in the city with certain programs that we've been speaking about, um, and they'll need to be addressed, uh, addressed. I have been, I think everyone's tired of my line here at the city, so I apologize, city manager, but the math has changed at the city, meaning that the proposed adopted deficits are now real. That means that any going forward, any diversion of revenues from the general fund, any new expenditures, new programs, the simple question is going to be need to ask from, of us from staff and of council, where are we taking this from? It, it is no longer a, we'll end up with flush with money at the end of the year and everything will be fine. Every addition needs to come with an equal subtraction. And in some places, more subtraction because we know we have a Um Next slide, please. So let's start talking about 
the different types of reserves. And, and to be fair, this is not all of our different reserves, but these are the ones that matter the most for this conversation. What's what I would call available and what's our contingency reserve we want to get really high. It's made up of three different things. Our council policy mandated reserves, which is 15 to 17 percent, 15 to 17 percent of our annual op give me one more, um, of our annual expenditures. So simply put, that reserve is critical for the city to have funding in case of disasters or a sudden economic downturn. Think 2017 wildfires, think Great Recession. In both of those instances, we nearly ex fully extinguish that amount. So it is a critical amount for the stability of the city to meet. The council policy mandates that if we were to fall below the 15%, part of the upcoming budget is to essentially create a surplus to fill that back in. So that's our baseline, we'll call that, of reserves, right? Above baseline, we'll call unassigned reserves. And that's anything above the 17%. This typically is what comes back to council and saying we have funding. What, what should we be looking to direct this funding towards? How, how can we activate that funding for the community? Um, it is used by council to fund one-time, one, it should be fund, used to fund one-time expenditures. Infrastructure facilities of the city, capital projects, and it is one time. I will add that when finance brings a deficit budget forward, like the one last year of $13 million, that is not all inclusive of everything we would like to be in that budget. We don't fund, we don't have a capital facilities fee, or excuse me, capital facilities fund at the, at the city to fund the maintenance of city facilities, to fund the replacement of city facilities. In reality, that kind of funding really comes from unassigned reserves. It comes from, we need to do X at X facility, we are going to appropriate unassigned reserves. So while it's available, I would still recognize it as a critical funding source for ongoing operations in many different ways. The third pot we'll put on here is our fiscal stability reserve. And I know we've talked a lot about this and I'm gonna talk about some more about it here in a minute. But that was the council action to take part of the pg and &E settlement and dedicate it to a fiscal stability reserve to use as a um, financial cushion, essentially for the situation we're in now where we're, where we're facing deficits and some structural change. Let's see. Next slide. So, um, our goal as a finance department with the fiscal stability reserves is, is we want the accounting of this to be as simple as possible. Um, I, I want you all to see exactly where this money has gone and exactly how it is, it is going down. And the prior year, we came in front of this body and, and discussed that we were going from $27.3 in fiscal year 22 down to 24 and we are using $3.3 million to address the deficit that was passed in the prior year. Um, again, one of my repeated lines here at the city is that governmental accounting standards are unforgiving. When a deficit is passed for 24, 25, it affects our reserves in the prior year. So the way that the governmental accounting folks think about it is that if you pass a deficit in your next coming year, you need current resources to pay for it. That makes sense. And so because you need current resources to pay for it, that's coming off of your reserves today, yeah. not tomorrow. That is a really sound way to do things. And if we weren't forced to do it, I would still want us to. We should essentially pay for the deficit tomorrow, today. Um, if that deficit doesn't come to fruition, it all gets chewed up. But the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that the timing of this is critical to understand and that it's, we're essentially a year ahead. So let me go through these line items. Um, we started at 27.3 in fiscal year 22. We used 3.3 of that last year at this time to address our reserve, our, our deficit. 
And that brought us down to 24 million as of fiscal year 23. Um, that deficit came to fruition. So there was no putting the money back. There was no money to put back. This current fiscal year deficit is 13.3 million. That comes off for fiscal year 24. That brings us down to 10.7 million. So I want to illustrate here that these large reserve balances are going away quickly. Next slide. This is a breakdown that gets us to our over policy amount. Okay. And I want to point out a couple of critical factors here. I show the same breakdown of, of that, that top number. Let's just call that the all inclusive number and move on. Fiscal stability reserves, I show that difference. We used to be at 24, now we're at 10.7, okay? Gets us to our total unassigned, total unassigned reserves as of 24. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take away the 17% mandated amount from, from council policy. And now notice that the 17% amount, because our expenditures are going up, 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 that number is higher than it was the year before. We went from 32.6, 35.9. That's prior to our contract ratification. So I'm expecting come 2025, that mandated amount that we need to hold for reserves again is going on. So again, coming back to the mayor, the complication of it's my savings account is much simpler than a reserve calculation. I've got multiple dials here impacting how much I truly have available in that when I look at our bottom line number, we can see that we've gone from 28.2 last year at this time, we've been the reported number to you all. Now we're at 22.3. So a, we'll call it 6 million. So it's 6 million there, and it is 13 million in the fiscal stability reserves amount. We're almost at a $20 million decrease overall of what, what we could deem as available reserves. So again, to illustrate, we are coming up with a strategy to shore this up, and we are going to be bringing forward ways that we can do that. It is going to be critical for us on a strategy basis to do so, to give us time. It is not such a simple schedule that I can provide you all with, here's the day you run out of reserves. That schedule is, should be continued. We need to shore up our reserve enough to get us to a strategic strength. Next slide. Oh, and I'll turn it over to Alan. I'll welcome any questions from you at this point. I'll turn it over to Alan. I think I pretty much met this one. I agree with you on the structural deficit versus the ongoing expenses. That seems to be a little bit um, confusing too. You know, the structural deficit makes more sense when you're saying this, you're still spending way too much more than you're bringing in versus a one-time money. So I think that also would be important for us to understand. I think like on the capital improvement programs, those type of things. The one fund that I, I haven't heard you talk about, maybe did it exist before, is where you have a facilities maintenance fund. Um, I know as a school board trustee, when we bought computers for everybody, we created a fund to make sure that they're being replaced and repaired. And so it took us making deci different decisions in the budget so that we created the facility maintenance of that type of equipment. We don't have that for any of our facilities it's now. A, it's a perfect question, so thank you for it. So we, along those lines, we have currently two funds like that. We have our vehicle replacement fund, where essentially we pay in and the vehicles get purchased out of that. Okay. And we have a computer replacement fund, where essentially we pay it, all the departments pay in monthly, and when it comes time to get their computer equipment replaced, it gets replaced. But, that thing but from a facilities yeah. perspective, we do not. We okay. do not have a, a, a savings bank or X facility at the city needs to be replaced. We have been saving up for it over time. That is the point. That is why I, I really wanted to talk about that available reserve amount, because when that need arrives, 
that's where it comes from. We don't have that savings account. You don't have the maintenance part of it. So we, we, we wait annual, until it's so critical to replace you. it. We annually budget for maintenance. So in other words, if the roof in this building leaks, which it has, we have appropriations to address the leaking. Okay. But we don't have the appropriations to address replacing the roof. Okay. Is that a good way to... So you have money for the Band-Aid, but you don't have money... Right. Correct. So there's no structure Correct. for that in place Correct. currently. And there never has been. Never is not a word I use around here because we've been around a long time. <laughs> never since my career, and that's I bet never enough. since his career. I think, I, and I that's, think that's long enough between the two. As of us. we look at the structure of the city budget, those are big items that I think have to even be addressed. And I don't know how to do it today with the current deficit, but Proper planning with government funds to me comes with some of those sacrifices that you have to make when you're appropriating how to address your facilities. And it goes like on our streets and roads, right? We wait until we're, I say it, we're at the end of a dirt road with a bunch of potholes. There's not even road anymore. And so how do we fix that much of it without having some type of stabilization, stabilization or maintenance funds set up for those? So this is going to have to be a future conversation, but I think those are the structural changes in the budget that we're going to have to make decisions as a council on how we address those things so that we, we don't have buildings that have $15 million worth of deferred maintenance on it. And now we're really at a loss of how do you eat the elephant? So I think those would be things I'd be interested in in the future, but it won't be popular because it's, it's not sexy and it's not a program, but it's actually how you fix your budget. I, I can't say it any better than that, so I won't try. Um, what I will just say is what, what I will just say is that the context is not only just for the future and how do we how do we fix that true root of this problem? The problem going forward is that if we run through our reserves, right, then what then what? Then you have nothing. Then so right. so it's going to be we're running through reserves, but all of a sudden we have our roof replacement to do. All right. of a sudden we need to buy a fire engine that we didn't anticipate. So, so it's a, I'm trying to express the strain on reserves. That isn't as simple as the checking account analogy that I would love if we have. And that's, that's what prompted the conversation is if we are dealing with structural deficits that comes with changing the structure of the budget too somewhat. Mm-hmm. So if we can, keep that as a thought of how we're going to do that in the future. I don't even want to take that on today, but it feels like it's something that in the very near future, we're going to have to. Understood. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so the first part of the presentation from Veronica and Scott, very informative. It lays out the problems that we have. This next part is going to be how we are addressing that and propose to address it going forward. Um, so, okay. Um, so, we are uh, tackling this issue in uh, in essentially two phases. Uh, we have the very immediate, and then the uh, uh, the more of the uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, um, uh, post-analysis, if you will. So immediately we have been identifying and implementing or to implement uh, ongoing cuts, one-time cuts uh, in the current fiscal year. Um, These are typically vacant positions and uh, um, operating uh, expenses that aren't critical Uh, We've also looked at project appropriations that could be returned to reserves, such in the way Scott Scott discussed. Um, The reductions of vacant positions and ongoing services are critical to chip away at the deficit that we have. Uh, Those go to solving that. Um, The reduction of the one-time costs boosts our reserves. And the reason for that, as Scott laid out, um, probably better than I will, is that what we want to do is uh, uh, sort of in, uh, increase the, pa- uh, uh, the the landing space that we have. As we're trying to land the plane and get us to balance, we need time to be able to uh, go through the, the very um, uh, uh, deep 
and, uh, and difficult reductions that we're going to need to make. We need to be very thoughtful about that. And, uh, and some of it may even uh, involve the community. The second phase of this is getting into that part of that, uh, where we would make uh, uh, reductions that aren't just vacant positions, but would uh, um, uh, could get it or would get into layoffs. Um, you're looking at program and service level reductions that would be uh, uh, visible uh, in the community and uh, and then restructuring what remains of the organization uh, to promote cost effectiveness and efficiency going forward. So, and then through all of that in that phase, we would be doing a third thing, which is uh, um, looking at everything else that we can put on the table that might be able to either mitigate the, the deficit or provide some sort of budget relief as we as we go along, whether it be one time or ongoing. Um, the first of that, and this is something that will be implemented within the 25-26 budget, is a modified zero-based budget. Um, this would uh, require departments to uh, examine their, their, uh, uh, their uh, uh, cost models that they have, their budget models, if you will, uh, and look at it in a different way. Um, to be perfectly frank, uh, um, I've been here a long time. I know how budgets are developed and most times they're just, you know, one year is layered on top of the other and we never really look to see uh, uh, the need for those appropriations. Uh, if, if it's not broken, why fix it and, and go forward? Well, we're at the stage now where we need to uh, break some budgets and, and fix them in that way uh, to use a, a probably pretty poor analogy. Um, uh, I will say that this is a, a difficult task to do. It. We are a large organization. To do a complete zero-based budgeting uh, would not work with us, so we are modifying that. And we have reached out uh, um, uh, to some folks to help us with this. Um, uh, going through something uh, uh, like that does require assistance when uh, uh, to make sure it's done right. Um, uh, so we figured out ways to use existing appropriations to have people come in and help Veronica and I move the departments through that process. What, what is the modified part? Thing? Sorry, I didn't catch it. So uh, it's, it's, it's the same methodology, but it's just more um, focused on uh, a smaller element. So again, uh, maybe looking more at processes and rather than the whole budget as, as a whole, taking parts of it, maybe only your services and supplies part of the budget and leaving the, uh, um, the positions off, we, we, those are, that's part of the stuff that we need to, to figure out as we go through. Um, and we have a, uh, like I said, an expedited time frame to get us into that, that area. Um, the other things that we're looking at is CalPERS does offer an early retirement program. Uh, um, uh, there are uh, hoops we need to jump through through that, and a lot of it is controlled by CalPERS, and it takes a little bit of time for that to happen. And to be, but essentially, what would happen is that if you have eligible employees uh, uh, that are nearing retirement, uh, they could grant, I think it's two years of, of service time that goes toward their pension. CalPERS would do an actuarial study, uh, uh, they would perform it, um, and the only way that this pro, uh, this program would work for us is that if they see the savings within it. So they would need to uh, uh, to study, identify that there is a savings before they would even allow us to do it. So it wouldn't be a case of, of let's say there wasn't a savings and we say, well, we want to do it anyway. CalPERS just frankly wouldn't allow it. So this is this is a process that will take some time. A savings for them, Alan, or a savings to our deficit? Our deficit. Okay, thank you. And uh, how many individuals do you, 
do we believe we have that would possibly, we have to ask them, we can't force anyone to retire, right? So yeah. how many individuals are we uh, estimating? Yeah, I, I don't know. No, it's, it's a no. lot. I mean, it's a lot. It's a sizable. We are a what, what Calpers would call a matured workforce. Okay, um, that's literally the term. Uh, and it would it would be an option open to anyone that qualified. So it, it's we don't not have a, to have a certain number to do it. Then no, and and it, and it would it would basically be anyone over the age of fifty would be eligible for this benefit. Hey, no, I mean for me. <laughs> All right. So the, the next thing we would look at um, uh, is uh, fleet reduction in the general fund. See if that's a, a potential for savings there of reducing vehicle units and, and uh, to generate some sort of, of, um, of cost savings from that. Um, we are, uh, we've already looked at and uh, so now we're at the point of, of making the determination of how much, if not all, of the general fund pension stabilization fund that we would uh, sunset uh, and return to the general fund um, or make a payment to PERS uh, uh, to benefit the general fund. Uh, we started, if you remember, in 2022 with that fund uh, with about $10 million in it. Uh, yeah, because I was confused. Yeah, I'm over here taking notes. Like, okay. Um, so these are not in the slide. They're just in oh, my... Got it. So, Take notes. Sorry. Um, they're in the one for the study session, so... But there's some information. So can we go to the, the next one? Can we get the next slide? Sure. Let's just go into the next slide. So uh, we have um, strategies that we're looking at in three different areas, administrative cuts, uh, operational cuts, and uh, programmatic cuts. So your administrative cuts are really targeting more inward elements of government, uh, including management, planning, and uh, uh, support and services. So um, the goal would be to uh, uh, ultimately have a more efficient uh, um, operation, looking at processes, looking at layers of management, um, making reductions where we need to in that area. Um, it would have uh, ideally a minimal impact on service delivery. Um, uh, especially to the, uh, to the community. Uh, next slide, please. Operational cuts. This is where we start looking outward and these are probably would be felt more in the community, um, still focusing on uh, um, efficiency, uh, but we would involve changes uh, in day-to-day -day service delivery, um, uh, and reducing costs in that area. And then next slide, please. Uh, then we would look at programmatic cuts where we could find uh, actual uh, programs to be able to eliminate. Um, uh, the, the goal in here would be to uh, reduce or eliminate specific programs off some based off of strategic evaluations, program effectiveness, cost efficiencies and things like that, and making sure that they're aligned with city policies or priorities. And next slide. So this is a five-year staffing history. Uh, we're basically showing a total head count um, in the city. Um, uh, we provide it for uh, just reference uh, and context. Uh, this includes all funds, not just the general fund. Um, the green shaded columns uh, show the high point of, of uh, our FTEs uh, before the Great Recession, before we started making cuts during that. Uh, and then the 12-13 fiscal year uh, is would be the uh, first year we adopted a budget without those recessionary 
uh, cuts. Uh, so it gives you a high point and a low point. And then the blue columns are showing just the last five years of, of staffing. Um, I would caution uh, to look more at the bottom line uh, because as you look at individual departments as they go along, there have been numerous uh, um, uh, organizational moves uh, where whole groups have moved from one department to another. And so it really skews the department FTE count going across, but the total count at the bottom is the one that you would want to look at. And yes, we have been increasing our staffing uh, over the last five years. We are not at where we were um, in uh, uh, 2008 and nine, uh, but we have increased staffing overall during that period. Uh, and then the next slide is just that same chart, but shown in a uh, graphic, um, Southwest colors. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so then the next slide, we start getting into uh, where we have been going with, uh, uh, with our reductions. As I said, we've had immediate, um, the first phase, uh, looking at immediate cuts. So we, uh, uh, we use as a reference a five and 8% uh, reduction amounts from the departments uh, and had them go in and look at what they could uh, eliminate from their budgets. Uh, again, mostly looking at vacant positions and uh, contracts and other things like that uh, to come up with something that could be eliminated uh, uh, ideally in the current fiscal year, or some of those have to bleed over into the, into the 25, 26 year, uh, largely because of attrition. Um, uh, they know that they have vacancies that are going to come in that year. Uh, so they're identifying those positions, but holding off until, uh, they're actually empty, uh, um, but uh, what you can see here is that on an ongoing basis, departments came up with about $6.2 million over those two uh, uh, years uh, to eliminate, being uh, $2.7 million coming from vacant uh, positions and $3.5 million from services and supplies and other operating costs. Um, in the current fiscal year, uh, uh, about 3.2 million of that 6.2 is stuff that we can eliminate this year. And I will be back with a, uh, um, a, a budget item uh, at council to make those cuts sometime in January. The next slide shows a summary of what we've done, not only what the, uh, the departments uh, were able to, to cut, but also uh, other items that we've talked about in, um, uh, in the presentation. So uh, we have looked at one-time uh, funds and we, I have a detail of it on the next slide, but right now we have one-time uh, uh, project dollars identified uh, at about 9.4 million. Uh, I mentioned the $12 million that are in the Pension Stabilization Trust so uh, those combined is about 21, a little bit over $21 million of one-time cuts that would be able to boost our general fund reserves to, to start give us that little bit of a longer runway. Um, and then for ongoing cuts, uh, we actually have about um, 8.2 million. Uh, you know, I apologize, uh, we have 3.8 million in, general fund vacancies shown. Um, that's, that's actually the total vacancy amount right now, but some of the cuts that the departments have identified are part of, of that overall 3.8. So the remainder of, of the uh, vacancy cuts available is about $2 million. Now, one of the things that I would wanna add with that is that not every position that's on that vacancy list is something that we could cut. For instance, I have a purchasing agent that's currently, that position is vacant. I have it filled with an acting 
uh, a person in an acting role now. But that position is identified in the charter. It's identified in city code. It's something I have to fill. Now, when it comes time for me to fill it, most likely the city manager and I are going to arm wrestle over what position that I would substitute for that purchasing agent. But there's going to need to be some sort of a trade off here or there. Um, then we also mentioned programmatic cuts. Uh, um, uh, we show safe parking here. Um, this is something that, that is currently um, funded through ARPA. Uh, we are looking for the potential of grants that could fund it going forward. Right now, we don't have that. It's kind of a misnomer to call that a budget reduction, though. It's actually budget avoidance, because right now, that program is not in the general fund and it's not in our, our five-year forecast. If we were to add it into the general fund, we would increase our deficit by that 1.3 million. So obviously, if they are able to come up with a, a, a funding source outside of the general fund, uh, then, then it would have no impact on the general fund. If we added it into the general fund regardless and just said, we're gonna keep it and do it, then we have, we've just added $1.3 million to our deficit and we have to cut that somewhere else. Um, next slide, please. So then we have one-time funds and the pg and project, or projects mentioned there. Uh, uh, we're showing them here. Um, the, just so y'all know the, um, the PG&E funded projects were created and the appropriation went out in uh, February of 2022. Um, uh, you know, we will uh, ask uh, and get updates from those project managers uh, uh, from time to time. Uh, I believe now we do it quarterly, uh, but the city manager's office staff and staff from my department uh, met with each of the project managers to uh, have kind of a, um, you know, no BS discussion about what can we really, what do we really need to move forward with? And what you see here is about $9.4 million of funding that can come back into the general fund. Um, these uh, uh, will not uh, impact, especially the ones that are related to fire and wildland resiliency. It doesn't impact what we're doing right now. They've either uh, uh, spent the money and the work is, is done or they have enough work to be done uh, uh, over time. It doesn't harm that operation. Or in a lot of the cases, uh, especially the more internal ones, um, uh, that they, they never kick the project off. And so you're looking at, should they be, should those funds be sitting in a project for something that may or probably not ever move forward or do you move it in to help your immediate budget need? And obviously we are recommending that you move that in and address your immediate budget needs. I think it may be worth I was going to say, so, um, I think we definitely should go to council, like, because they're going to be a lot of. Yeah, so I, I think it's worth spending a moment just picking if, you know, some of these ones that jump off the page and kind of qualifying them for you. As Alan mentioned, uh, finance along with city manager's office, we, we've had really robust discussions with, with our departments really regarding every single one of these. As Alan mentioned, some of them just have not kicked off yet. Some of them are done and we have some leftover money. And then some of them, there's what I would call a timing issue with, with the funding. Uh, I'll point that out with the fire, uh, or the, excuse me, the vegetation management specifically. This is not defunding that program fully. The program will have no impacts through the year, fiscal year 27, as a plan developed through the city manager and the fire department. Really, the city needs to take a look at our vegetation management pro uh, program as a whole. We're going to have that time through fiscal year 2027 to do so. So again, as Alan mentioned, not an immediate impact to the public safety here. 
But again, it gives us now, we have an immediate operating issue at the general fund. We are taking that funding on the out years and moving it to general fund operations now. The other one I think that's particularly confusing is not enough information is on here, um, is the Fountain Grove $3.8 million, which is a large amount of money. So by no means is this defund the Fountain Grove project at all. This is an example of a FEMA funded project that uh, Jason and Alan brought to council uh, back in November of 21. And at that time we dedicated PG&E funding because we didn't know the things we didn't know yet about the FEMA projects. We wanted to be conservative and dedicate PG&E funding there so that if our reimbursements didn't exactly come in the way we wanted to, we could shift this money, this specific $3.8 million around within the FEMA portfolio to cover it. We fortunately, I can say, have done very, very well through Alan's hard work and along with the departments of recovery through FEMA. This funding at this point is not needed there. It is more appropriate to be released. So again, I want to let you all know and the public who may need to know this, we are not defunding Fountain Grove through this action. This is really cleaning up the appropriation at this point. Um, would that be the same for the fire station five rebuild? It would, correct, <laughs> correct. So right now we put a pretty large contingency on that contract. Right now, uh, Public Works feels comfortable saying that's the, it's, it's $500,000 overfunded given the contingency. It may actually end up being a little bit more, but as of right now, we're comfortable with $500,000. Um, I'll point out a lot of these on a fourth way they changed, just efficiencies gained from the departments. Um, a great example of that is the city clerk's office and the translation services. Uh, using Having some Google Translate applicability really work well and, and turn out where that was just a gained efficiency for them. Um, again, like I said, I could talk about a lot of these have a pretty robust conversation around them, but those are probably the ones I would point out right immediately that, that I would have immediate concern over looking at them. Yes. Um, you mentioned the allocations and encumbrances earlier. Mm -hmm. And is this 9.4 million and 12 million, is that the bulk of the allocations and encumbrances that have been discovered today or are there mm -hmm. others out there? No, this is, this is, well, let me make sure, could you? You mentioned, you mentioned, the, you mentioned that you were hunting around for allocations and encumbrances that might be be able to be brought back into play. Yes. Is this the bulk of those or there's other, are there others that have been? This will well? be the bulk. Okay. There certainly will be others, but the city manager and, and finance, we really pointed at these pg &E funds to say, this is a known bucket of general fund resources. Now is the appropriate time, given the timing to really dig into all of them. I will say that Veronica and her staff, they are doing this analysis level of our projects and appropriations annually. That is happening on an annual ongoing basis of our ongoing projects. This is unique. This is unique because it was more outside of the normal. So we gave that, that extra, extra kind of analysis. Um, I'm interested in the uh, DEI programs and how we're still gonna achieve the expectations. So some of this was related to seed. So uh -huh. It's no longer going to be on contract mm -hmm. because we have Fran Francesca on board. Okay. We are going to remove the equity dashboard, data dashboard for $50,000. I did have a conversation today. We're going to actually remove that. They do need that $50,000 to track their equity um, implementation. Um, but everything else, um, if you're talking about DEI spaces, which one are you talking about specifically? I just saw a lot of DEI on here. Yeah, a lot of it was just we um, prioritized a lot of money for C, but now that we all have staff on board, we don't need that money for C. Yes, ma'am. So I go back to some of the organizational restructuring, which is at the beginning of the budget reduction strategy, which is the opportunity you do have when you're in a structural deficit. So as as we learn the departments, like I'm just going to say it like TPW right now, the understanding of what falls under that category, I think is going to be important for the conversation. I know it's 
it's getting into the weeds more when it comes to council, but if we're not understanding, we have a testing lab for the cement company, how much does that cost us? What is, those are the decisions that I know a lot of times fall on all of you, but we get the blowback for that. So I think understanding how the departments work in HR, I see you have 23 people working with a staff of 1300. Typically what I've seen in most businesses you don't have that many HR for staff. So I'd like a deeper understanding of what some of that work is. So it's not appropriate for me to be the one that says these are the staff we should lay off, but looking at the organization as a whole and looking at those efficiencies, I think is helpful to understand. And it's helpful, I think, for us to be able to give feedback just based on business or other government structures we've been part of where that was something that had to shift or we used technology to be able to achieve what is now currently being done, unfortunately, by people. So, um, and then also like in PED, we talked about how can we shift some of the red tape so that it's not so staff um, heavy and technology and use of permits online, that type of thing could be streamlined. I know that's something that's already been brought forward, but I think when I'm looking at your strategies on your cuts, um, anything we could do to keep the cuts further away from the impact to the community. So when we're looking at services out in our streets and roads, we get those complaints a lot around potholes. We get complaints about the cleanliness of bathrooms, that type of facility and maintenance. They don't care as much if we do admin cuts. Our constituents don't. Don't, that doesn't impact them as much as it does the organization. So I think that you've laid it out really well, but I think that that's something that we are going to have to have more information brought forward as we dive into this. If the programs haven't been started, then we don't feel that loss the same way we would if we have to cut staff. So I would be more interested in looking at that. If it's DE&I strategies with our new DE&I manager, how can she work with the departments to have them integrate the work versus hiring somebody else in to do that? I think as an organization, we might be ready for those type of different strategies. But I'm, I appreciate the information around this one-time funds PG&E projects. The concern of the community, I think, will all be around fire management and the safety of wildfire. So I think explaining how that works as that comes forward to council, that's what's coming forward to us at the end of October will be critical um, because we are in the midst of fire season right now. So I, I would just caution those um, those conversations. Yeah, thank you, Councilwoman McDonald. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, what is important about a phased approach it allows us to have a strategic buffer and it cushions the immediate impacts, you know, the service and the staff and allows us to you know, support the organizational health and the community. So that's why we're looking at a phased approach as well. Better way to do it. Um, I was also, also gonna say, I think it's important when we're making cuts that we are not uh, top heavy. That we understand that although management and executive staff are important, we need people out there doing the work. Um, that sound probably sounds bad because all of you guys are, but I, I'm, I'm being very serious. Like we need to make sure that we don't have more managers and stuff. And we have people that are actually out there, um, doing the work because that's, that's not fair. And, and yeah, Mayor, we, yeah, we appreciate that. I think one example you can point to is our parks department. So when you start looking at programmatic cuts, and let's just say we use parks, for instance, there's nowhere to cut. There's no landscape maintenance, right? So because those individuals were cut back in whatever year we had the cut. Um, and the, the community suffered. So we had to find a way to backfill that and still need to find a way to move forward, which is why reserves are important, because we still have to find a way to move that department forward. Um, so we, we hear you, um, we agree. It's not anything that we're taking lightly. Um, the whole process is very um, um, taxing, you know, and especially to the people who sit up here because that's a choice that we have to make. 
but we hear you loud and clear. Uh, community service and the public, uh, that's going to be first in mind when we're looking at this. Thank you. Vice Mayor. I guess I have a few more. Uh, actually, let's, let's back up to one of, my, one of my favorite and most used talking points in recent months. Um, what year was it that we had maximum staffing? Was it 2008 or was it a few years before? It was 2008. 2008. That was it. That was when we hit peak staffing. Yeah, I believe so. Okay, so we're down five, that we're down five percent in staff, even though the city's increased by about twenty thousand people. So that is a that that talking point has been effective in conversations I've had. People don't realize that you have a smaller city now than we did or that is 16, 16 years ago. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. That was a that was a very nice, very nice chart. Um, I had one question about the op, uh, the operating or the with on the slide about department reductions, the operating costs, where there was uh, a note of three point five million in ongoing operating cost savings, ongoing, and then for this fiscal year, one point six million. Are those entirely because of through efficiency? What's what's the what's the nature of those savings? Yeah, so I think the big bulk of that is uh, right. Um, about yeah, about four or five, four four hundred and fifty thousand, I think, was in professional yeah. services and head. They were feeling if they could so is it streamline streamlining processes or or they just no longer have the need. So several years ago they were adding professional services to their budget annually more and more as their influx of permit applications were going sky high and okay. had always said from the start that that increased budget was something that they could react to and reduce if there was ever a downturn and so we're starting to see that downturn and so they have offered up some of their professional services budget to reduce rather than lay off permanent FTEs so for where they used to send out some of their work in the past to outside parties now they're saying they can reduce that instead. Interesting. So, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. So, but if the work picked up, then they'd probably go back to the former processes. So that may, those savings might be reversed in the future. But if the work picks up in theory, we'll have more revenue to offset an increase in professional services. That's what we saw, you know, maybe in there we go. 17, 18, we saw revenues coming in high and they were so, so busy. So we added in professional services to help augment that workload. Understood. Well, thank you. Thank you for breaking out those operating cost savings. Um, I guess to, to throw my cards on the table, what I'm listening for, well, let me back up on their step. This was a great presentation and it gave me all the information I was looking for. So thank you for all the work that went into this because this is, it is complicated and it's emotional and all of that. I mean, having been through this both in the private sector and in the public sector before, I'm familiar with that side of the table. So thank you for all the, all the work that you're doing. From this side of the table, what I'm looking for is how three years from now, when we are through this, how we're a, we're a better city, not just a smaller city. And the best points that I've heard from everyone of you on the dais is all of you at, at points chipped in and said, it gave me a sense of how we're gonna be better in three years from now. Because we're, we're, not, just, we're not just doing across the board cuts, we're looking for ways to, to automate, to reduce unnecessary processes, um, a variety of ways for us to, to um, just be a better city when we, when we get through this in three years. So thank you for that. I had a few more points here. Um, just step down. One question I had, or here, I'm gonna be a, a bit of a broken record on this for uh, at least the next couple of years. You're stuck with me for two and a half more at least. Um, do we have a sense, I and mean, we're, we're early in the process. Now, thanks for mentioning the zero-based budgeting. And I, I get that we're, we're very early in the process. But are we finding areas that we, that we think we want, to, we want to invest in over the next couple of years at the same time as we're making cuts elsewhere? Are we, are we close enough to have a sense that, hey, we know that some, some areas are effectively revenue generating, um, whether it's PED, whether it's grants, from the department? Uh, I suspect the answer is no, which is too early in the process. But for conversations like this in the future, I'm listening for that. How, again, we're not just doing across the board cuts, we're prioritizing. Um, and I'm hearing I'm hearing glimmers of that already. Did you want to take a crack at that off the? So, yeah, and I'll wait for the hook to get me to stop talking. Um, the right. So the answer, the short answer is no. We we don't have that. Yet. But that's that's what we would expect. And and I know that that we have uh, 
uh, fresh eyes coming in from new department heads and and that that are looking at their operations with that type of analysis in mind. Um, we are, you know, if I would expect all departments where they've had longstanding uh, um, processes that that those are ripe for change. Uh, I have that in my own department. And, and those are things that, that we'll address as, as time goes on through this process. I also think that we are going to get to a point where uh, we are going to need to start looking at the general fund as a whole and make reductions in some areas of the general fund, but actually add to others. Uh, and you still have a net reduction, but what you're doing is you're, you're seeing... Uh, uh, workload going down in some areas and you make the reduction there, but you're, you're, you're seeing it go up and you're quantifying that, which is, I think, the thing that this committee and the council is going to want to see is, is us to be able to go in and quantify the fact that we need, you know, another attorney. We need this, we need that. And, and to be able to look at the, uh, again, the general fund as a whole and make those types of adjustments. It, and we are, I would imagine that, that as we go through the development, definitely the development of the 25-26 budget, but certainly in the 26-27 budget, you'll probably see those types of things. And yeah, so there's my medium long answer. Thank you for that. And that's an unfair question because they're so early in the process. I thought I'd, I thought I'd highlight it just because I'm going to be listening for that for the next couple of years, because I think it's a sign that we're being creative and we're, and we're prioritizing. Just when you're going through this process, especially in a large organization, it's so hard to do. We, we've discussed that some targeted investments are going to help us long term for economic growth. Yeah. And we're going to have to spend money in other places, even though we have to cut in other places. So we're, we're looking at that. Well, thank, thank you both for emphasizing that and just know that I'm certainly supportive of that. If you come to me saying we are, we are, you know, we are changing the way they're allocating, that's, I'm expecting and hoping for that. Most of my questions were, were answered. I, I just wanted to reiterate one point that my, that my colleagues made. Um, when we're obviously going to be having the cuts brought to us at the council level, that's, that's a given. When we're talking about program cuts, what's helpful for me is to have the, when we're, talking, when we're talking about discrete programs, it's helpful for me to have the operational context. And I really liked the way that, that, um, that all of you presented hypothetical cuts when we we're talking about safe parking, in response, some of the vegetation management. It's hard at the, it's hard at the council level to have discrete programs brought and say, and, and, and have us be asked, do you want this or not? Because I don't know what the plan is. Um, but it sounds, it's clear from the discussion today that there is, that uh, the context is being fleshed out for those cuts. So when, so on the 22nd and after, when we're being asked to potentially, potentially make cuts to some of these programs, give us as much operational context as, as possible in terms of how we're going to perform the services. Um, because again, to be, to be blunt, I'm not wedded to any specific program, say, say uh, safe parking, for example, but I am wedded to the idea that we are, we are working to keep you know, our streets clean and safe and, and deal with RV parking and whatnot. So I just, I just want information for how that's being handled. And if we do it in a different way than we're doing currently, that's, that's, and, and we can do it more efficiently, or efficiently, that's great. So, okay. yeah, because this is a really valuable point. And so the, the guidance that we've given departments to your exact point, it is going to be very challenging for council to look at discrete programs and think of it uh, as a menu. Because in reality, what we've asked the departments to do is to come back exactly how you're saying it, as in how does this program intertwine into your organization and then help me follow that change, how it gets down to the program. And the reality is that each of our programs is intertwined administratively and with each other. And so when we look at them just on a one-off basis, it's very hard. And I've had that experience with our departments where I go, wait a minute, why are we cutting that? It doesn't make sense all by itself. It only makes sense once you follow the string and the tendril to see how it fits into their shaping of their organization. 
So your point is very well taken, and that has been our direction to the departments. You, you guys are ahead of me, and I've liked everything that I've seen today. At the, at the end of the day, on the, when, on the day, I want to vote for a plan. I don't want to, to your point exactly, I don't want to vote for specific cuts. I want to know what the operational plan is that's going to make us a stronger city three years from now. And I want to be supportive of that. I think that's it for me. Yeah. I mean, I think the one thing that, that Mark touched on was when you're looking and we're just going to pick on safe parking because it's right here. It's $1.3 million within ARPA funds. I also want to know the impact on the budget, the real impact. So it costs us 1.3 million, but without the program, what's the cost? That's often not given to us. So what were we paying to remove RVs off our streets prior to that? What were we paying for cranes to come in? There's only one gig in town that can move them. Where were we storing those and where did we put them? So I think that's the context too is, if we, it, it's the whole plan, like you're saying, if we remove this program, this is the plan to address the concern that's going to come forward because it already has been a problem in the past. And that helps us with that narrative of why we made this decision. Because if you just look at them as cuts, 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 we have to be able to go back out and go, well, this is what the plan is. Um, so that we're trying to do our best to keep the cuts as far away from your neighborhoods and the community as we can. So it was, that was a great point, Mark, is the menu, uh, yeah, and not the items. If we're talking about safe parking, though, we're picking on safe parking. Well, it's in here, uh, so I did. No, 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 I know. I'm just saying that that's right, what right, we're right. talking about. When you talk about uh, the impacts and stuff like that, we're still, we still have uh, RVs on the, on the street. We still have to deal with that. It's not like we put 42 RVs in a space and that we no longer have to deal with um, deal with RVs on the street, have to deal with tons of trash that are being left when they move. I mean, so I don't know about your district, but my district, I'm still feeling the impacts. And, and the safe parking is in my district and I'm still feeling the impacts. So um I don't even know if you can quantify, put a number because we're still dealing with it. It's not something that went away because we had a program. Um, and so that, that was just a response that I wanted to say um, to that. But if we don't have any other uh, questions, what's next? So our next steps, um, we will be in front of you with a similar presentation uh, um, on October 22nd. As I mentioned before, um, I'll be bringing a mid-year budget adjustment um, in January uh, that will make uh, the cuts uh, effective. Uh, we, we, are, we don't have it on the, on the calendar yet, but we've been discussing uh, whether to have a budget reduction study session, almost like a follow-up uh, in April, uh, leading into uh, budget adoption in the budget study session. So that one would focus specifically on what uh, changes we're making to the 25-26 budget um, and do that sometime in April. Uh, so you would have that in April, we would be able to get uh, council feedback. And then as we go in, we would have our normal budget uh, study session in May, uh, but it gives us enough time to be able to incorporate uh, any changes or anything that we need to make into the budget before adoption in June, which rounds out the end of my bullet points there. Um, and with that, I think we heard, well, if there are any other questions, or comments that you may have. All right. I just want to say thank you for the presentation and for the heads up on what's about to come. And um, yeah, it's very thoughtful the way it's being done and for being so open to our feedback today to incorporate what we feel is best, at least from my perspective, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. And just thank you for doing it, period. It's so easy just to do across the top cuts, but to be thoughtful about it and how it's going to impact the community, I think is very important. And I, I feel that like you guys are being very thoughtful um, and engaging
the departments. So it's not like finance and the exec step, like you guys are telling them what they're going to do or what's best for their departments. You're actually engaging them and having the conversations. So but overdue. I'm sorry we had to do it this way, but we probably should have done it already. So happy is getting done. All right. So with that, we will now uh, go to, oh, there's no one, um, there was no one present for public comment on item 4.1. So with that, we will now move to 4.2, our event funding. And um, that'll be CFO also. It will be me. Um, this, this will be uh, probably a pretty short uh, thing. We don't have a presentation for this. This is, uh, uh, this is an item to bring up um, uh, and I, we will have sub, subsequent meetings where we'll talk about it, but we wanted to uh, throw across at what we are uh, trying to address the way uh, community promotions are, are funded. We have a certain amount of money, uh, I believe it's 125,000 uh, for community promotions right now. Uh, um, we, our, uh, our idea is to, uh, to get priority of what the city should fund. Um, a, uh, you know, maybe one of those things should be a, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm losing the word. Grade or yeah, it's, it's, it's a signature or event. That's what I meant to say, a signature event. And then, uh, and then whatever is left over maybe goes to one or two others, but you're really focusing those dollars on one particular three maybe items. Uh, um, and I think in all fairness, we probably, uh, uh, I know we've changed our process with community promotions. It's now in, in planning economic development. Uh, so having that discussion without them there is, you know, maybe we Probably need to, here. yeah, <laughs> in, in hindsight, sorry, Scott, if you're listening, um, uh, we'll, uh, so we'll be back with, with more, but we wanted to try to kick that, at least get it um, rattling around a little bit, uh, uh, that that's something that we do see as an issue. Um, we need to make sure that, that we uh, get some direction from the committee uh, as we go forward uh, uh, with how to spend those dollars. Yeah, and if we decide to have a signature event, do we want that money to come out of community promotions? Correct. Or do we want to fund that event, you know, during the budget process? Would be a question as well. So. Wait, how much do we have for So community promotions, we allocate $125,000 annually for that. And then that gets spread to a number of different um, uh, events. Um, some Thanks. of the traditional ones that you see over and over, Rose Parade, okay. Wednesday Night Market, those types of things. And then uh, other programs that come through, uh, Planning and Economic Development have a, they have um, uh, an application process and a, uh, a vetting process through that, that that allocates the funds to, to different programs. Uh, I think what we're finding is that in some of them, uh, maybe the, the cost for uh, a signature event may completely blow up the, the, the entire community promotion budget. So we have to try to figure out ways to get around that. And maybe what, as the city manager pointed out, is that you have a an event that the council decides is this is the one that showcases Santa Rosa and you leave that separate from community promotions and it is a you know annual signature event something like that just a bit Paul so who has been you said that who is making the determination of where the money how the money is being spent so the application process yeah and a committee was determined yeah. They review the applications and then they determine who gets the funding. Um, I, 
I find it very interesting that events are being sponsored and councils not even being invited to events, but events are being sponsored, like we'll sponsor a table um, and council is not invited, but we are the representatives for the city. So I don't know if this is the appropriate place to have a conversation, but I find that very uh, interesting that that happens and I, I'm not too sure how it happens, but it probably needs to not happen. Um, and then we end up paying for our own tickets, going to events to represent the city. Um, also, uh, is there any way for, um, and I know that it's adding additional work to the city manager's office, but are you notified of uh, sponsorship of events? So, no, this is the first year that I've actually even received the spreadsheet on the application process, how much funding was available and actually who was chosen. Um, I think it's a good thing that we have uh, Scott Adair sitting in that seat uh, because he has been, he has sent me the updates. And I, I don't know if he put the committee together or who put the committee together, but it was the first time I was officially notified. Okay, and then, um... When we talk about Wednesday night market, um, I know a lot of us are very enthused about that and frequent Wednesday night market because it's a lot of fun and it's a great event for our community. Um, also the Rose Parade, um, things like that. I know staff had a lot of fun going and being a part of it. Would we, uh, just to be clear, we're not taking over the committee itself. We might we're, we're just giving money. We might appoint somebody maybe to sit on the committee to give input. No, nothing. We're just giving money. That's what we're asking. That's what we're asking. What we For us, if you ask me my personal recommendation, I think the Rose Parade to be our signature event. Um, and I think everything after that, you know, I think it should go through a process. Uh, a lot of these, I uh, think Wednesday, Wednesday night, Wednesday night market, I believe they are supposed to fundraise. And I believe the Rose Parade does too, but I think the Rose Parade says something about our city. You know, it, it, so I think there tends to be a difference. Do we want to activate the square? Yes. So would Wednesday night market be a good in investment? Yes. You know, so, you know, I mean, that's the call that I need for the council to make because what's happening is individuals are reaching out to us and staff saying, hey, we're short. Like I have a have a, a, a request now that we're short $40,000 for the ice rink, you know, so those that nickel and dimes, they add up. And is it fair? You know, is it fair? We, I think, you know, our community, community promotions is the process that we have, but when people come 40, 50, $60,000, who's to say it's, it's fair for the city manager to say, yeah, you know, this is good for our community because everything is good for our community. So would that come to council then? It doesn't have to because it's within the city manager's authority. So are you going to, but you, you just, I'm confused because I thought you just said you didn't want to make. I don't want to make the decision because, yeah. for, go ahead, Mark. No, no, finish your thought, Mark. No. I, I don't want to make the decision because, I mean, it's, it's just unfair. To me, it's just, we have a community promotions process, right? Mm -hmm. I think everything should go through that process. This year, Rose Parade came back and it took up $50,000. I think it was a great investment. You know, you had a lot of foot traffic. It boosted the economy. But I think outside of that process, I think we just need to be mindful when requests come in, whether it comes into the city manager's office or not, or whether it comes to the mayor, the vice mayor, council, that we follow the same process. And I think that's that's what we're asking. And I, I think that my... Uh question I appreciate your I don't think my question was answered okay so my question is when you say that's our signature event right meaning signature like we're dumping money into it and then other people are planning it and we have no say and they're going to do what they want to do that's our signature event or that we have some we're going to have some engagement in the planning process because there's already a board yeah, we don't want to plan. We do not want to plan. We, no. When I say signature event, so a Christmas parade, right? Do we want to fund the Christmas parade? You know, is that going to be the city's 
signature event that they're going to fund. Oh, so just the event that we're going to dump work. money into. Okay, got it. Probably not the best choice of words. Sorry. Yes. Having, having sat through endless sponsorship money divvying out discussions in other contexts, I strongly, I strongly support the idea that economic development take the lead in coming up with a strategy for divvying out those funds and that maybe some kind of plan comes back to long-term finance or, or council or whatever the process is. Um, but having Scott take the first crack at that would be much appreciated. And I suspect by your office as well. With, with an economic development eye. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, and, and this is all very valuable for staff. And, and I think staff, to be frank, we struggle sometimes around the sponsorship versus promotion difference, okay? And I think we, we need to be mindful of staff and we need councils, this really their, their direction between the two. And I hear your table uh, example is, a, is the perfect one to give because I think that's where we need to have some, some clear direction on it. Exactly to the city manager's point. We don't want to be making those decisions. We want a policy to follow for the vice mayor, exactly what we're speaking of. Again, but there's a difference between a promotional event of the city where the entire community is invited versus a sponsorship event, which is private. Mm. Because most of these sponsor a table events that I've seen come across my desk are private events. And that we need a better conversation around public funding to go to a private event, regardless who, of who is representing the city or if not is happening. Where is that money coming from? The general fund. For promotions. The general fund. So the departments don't have a promotional budget? They're just writing checks on the general fund? Correct. I mean, the budget is within the job. Oh, okay. But it's coming from the departments have allocated monies for promotion. Yes. Okay. That's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. I think. Yes, ma'am. So when it comes to signature events, a couple things that pop out, and I know this came up last year around Cinco de Mayo event in Roseland. Um, when we sponsor an event, what I'm concerned about is around insurance and liability so when we are, is there a certain cap that when we sponsor now we take on the liability, same with Rose Parade or any of those other events, and then it comes with staffing. So the true cost is not the 50. We actually have to have police and fire and other services on hand. So I think that that's why we have to narrow down what exactly we're doing so that all of those factors, when it comes to true budgeting, for an event have to be mitigated in, in for council. So for me, it's absolutely with an economic eye. If the Rose Parade is bringing in X amount of dollars and that in our downtown area and that infusion of dollars that come out from that initial investment, those are the things I'm interested in seeing us promote. Other things feel great to be part of, but we have to have that eye on what's going to actually bring a return back. And I'll use the 420 event. That was the Earth Day. I'm going to say that that probably brought in more money to our city because that party, and it was 420, went all evening and all the downtown businesses had music and, and entertainment. So, and I know that was probably done through um, water because it was Earth Day. But those are the things as we look at the city and the planning what other city events can we have that are in the downtown area that we can support that staff that we know about that also help our economy? But I think having somebody else go first crack at things, that's great. But I'm in support of narrowing down what it is that we're doing because of the actual true cost of it. And, and I know that that's going to cause some uncomfortable conversations. I would just ask that that go out widely that in the past, we know that you've been given money for things, but this year we are going to focus on what our goals and strategies are. And we've done that in VPP before they gave out choice grants to whoever the, the grant sounded good. But now we are giving out grants solely based on our strategic plan. And if you fit our strategic plan and our goals, then you get money from the city. Otherwise you don't. Can uh, can I ask a clarifying question sure. too? When um, if let's say we give money to um, the Rose Parade, 
we're giving money to the Rose Parade. We're not giving in-kind services like police or something like that, right? Because we automatically do it. I'm sorry. We gave a combination. Yeah, we did. We ducked it. We did a combination. Yeah. yeah. So we do both. Yeah. We give money and then, and then they pay for some. We say we do a combination, meaning no, they didn't pay for anything. So we took the fifty thousand dollars and we subtracted the in the services that the city would have provided. Okay, oh, we did. Yeah. So it, it is a part of the money that we've allocated. Yes. It's not in addition to, is what I was uh, wondering. So they actually uh, kind of paid for it. Um, and then when she talks about liability, that that is pretty interesting to know. Like, do we have? We don't. We don't. No, we don't accept the liability. It is on the event planner. Uh, yeah. So, so we're just giving money. But if the correct. event isn't showing the city that they have the proper coverage, that's the piece of the process that needs to be had. So Rose Parade Committee comes forward. They put in the paperwork. They need to show that they have all the insurance, all the coverage for the umbrella for the day. And that needs to be part of the process so that at the last minute, they don't say, oh, we don't have any insurance coverage. And then we're scrambling because I know that's happened for other events within the city. That's inappropriate mm -hmm. uh, to me. So those types of processes put in place ahead of time, I think would be healthy for the city. I hope this was helpful. Um, we have a lot of ideas. <laughs> But uh, so do you guys have any questions or anything you need to clarify with us before we do? So do we want to come back with the definition of signature event, the event that the city is going to promote? We want one event. I personally would like to because I like the Rose Parade and I like the Wednesday night market and that's 12 weeks of economic. Like, so it's it's more than just. Uh, one event and I and it definitely activates the square and I think is a great idea to have that continue it we've had it for what 30 30 years 30 something years and I don't know why uh we should stop now I mean Thursday night market Tuesday it was different days but Way we've had time. the we've had the market and it's been a staple in our community so I would like to that's my vote I don't know how you ask the rest of council yes I'd like a recommendation for economic development or whoever in the city runs it. I come tell them, give, give me a strategy. I would like the economic development lens too, but I agree with Mayor. Those are two events that we see as great starters. And then the third event, I think potentially could be a Cinco de Mayo event, Roseland too, to include that portion. Everything's not going to be economic uh, development driven. Some things just need to be community driven. And we need to have a sense of community because that's what makes Santa Rosa. And that's how we still have the small town feel, although we're growing, is we have community events. So yes, I understand that we need uh, economic drivers. I'm not naive to that, but I still feel like we need to have a sense of community within our community because it makes people feel like this is home. Um, and so sure, Scott can tell us what he thinks, but I'm still probably gonna have the same, unless it's taken away from something, I'm still gonna have the same um, opinion when it comes to that. So any other comments? No, uh, we have no one here to provide public comment on item 4.3. So we're gonna move on to item five and that's future agenda items. Um, I will not be here on the 14th. Diana will not be here on the 14th. I don't have anything pressing for that. Um, we're going to be probably moving off of the 22nd. So maybe that's uh, one that we we cancel that one. I will not be here on the 14th. So I don't think we have a choice. Okay. We'll have cancel. A Hold on. That, that's uh, that supposed to be here. NLC. Yes, ma'am. Um, anything, Vice Mayor? Nope. All right. So, uh, do you guys have anything future agenda items? Um, no, not right now. Not right now. All right. Um, and I'll also say if we don't have anything on an agenda today was great, awesome. It was a lot of information. 
we don't have to meet if we don't have anything on an right. agenda. I just don't want us to make a meeting for the sake of making a meeting. It takes a lot of staff time and it we don't have to. Right. So I don't want you guys to feel pressed that we have to. Yeah. So our our next the you know the next really big meeting is going to be the one that we do in January, which is our mid-year uh, budget performance. Um, I think as we get closer to uh, um, going into next year's budget, it, we'll, those are teed up. And okay. how we're doing the, the reductions, how we're going through our strategies, developing the plan, all of those types of things are the things that are going to happen a lot in the latter half of the fiscal year, kind of leading through, you know, November and December. Um, uh, that's where we're prepping for budget uh, input at that point. So, um, but we will, if something pops up, we'll definitely uh, throw it out to the committee to have the agenda. Okay. Um, and I, I think we're very lucky. I think mean, we have a great, uh, we have great staff here at the city. Um, I'm, I don't say that just because you guys are sitting here. I really do think we're lucky. We have great staff here. So thank you for everything you do. Um, and with that, we will adjourn. Thank you.